the uncontrollable female urge to go out and buy things, I do take issue with telling people the possible reason they are sick is from clutter. One thing I can guarantee that you won't find is research that says clutter is good for you. How can you possibly claim that fewer toys is best for kids? Number one, you've gotten rid of too much stuff and you've gone too far. Triple laughing face. Wow. Today I'm going to be answering some of the biggest criticisms that people have about minimalism, hopefully in a way that's helpful, non-confrontational, and maybe even a little bit funny. But I can't guarantee that things won't get a little bit spicy as I respond to these comments, which I want to emphasize are real actual comments from real actual people that I got on Instagram. I got the idea to do this video when one of my reels went viral and got over 11 million views and over 1,000 comments. And it's kind of funny because I always joke with my YouTuber friends that I know a video or reel is doing well because that's when all the haters and trolls come out. And I figured this was the perfect opportunity to flip things around and turn a negative into a positive by answering some of the most common questions and clearing up some of the biggest misunderstandings that people seem to have about minimalist living. And even if I'm not able to change anyone's mind, maybe it can help normalize minimalism a bit because at the end of the day, aren't we all just normal people out here trying to live our best lives? So on that note, let's dive into the first question, which reads, talk about getting rid of garbage, junk, broken items, useless items, things that no longer serve our purpose. Don't be telling people to get rid of 90% of what they own. Do you not have any sentimental items? Maybe no one has given you a gift you treasure and display, poor you. This person seems to be making a lot of assumptions about me, which tells me that they're probably new to my Instagram and have never seen my YouTube videos and are not familiar with my story at all because I would never tell anyone else to get rid of 90% of what they own. I was just sharing that that's what I did. And to expand on that, the reason that I was able to get rid of 90% of what I owned was because I used to be an emotional hoarder. I was a second generation hoarder who lost both of my parents, plenty of grandparents, other friends and family members, and my childhood home in my early 20s. And that left me with all of this stuff. And the funny thing is they say, do you have nothing that's sentimental? But back then, everything was sentimental to me because I felt like everything was a memory, everything was precious. And because so much had been taken away from me, I then wanted to hold on to as much as possible. And not only was that keeping me stuck in my past like a prison, but it also meant that all of the clutter that I had piled up in my home was causing me a lot of stress and anxiety. And when I finally started decluttering, that's when this weight felt like it started lifting off of my shoulders. And in fact, one of the most wonderful benefits about this minimalism journey that I've been on for almost eight years now is that after I was able to get rid of all of that excess stuff that I didn't need, I'm better able to honor and appreciate the sentimental items and the things that I do love and use on a regular basis. I personally believe the amount of stuff that you own is irrelevant because it's not so much about saying that you own nothing, but being able to say that nothing owns you. And it's up for you to decide what that looks like and what the balance of that is going to be in your own life. The next comment reads, so dumb. People always coming up with some stupid BS instead of just going to therapy and shutting the heck up. What's interesting about this comment is that I actually agree with it to some extent. Not the rudeness and the cursing, of course, but the fact that decluttering and minimalism alone can't fix all of your problems. While it's true that reducing clutter can lead to improved mental and physical health, there are plenty of other reasons that people can struggle with clutter that can't be solved by simply getting rid of stuff. For example, as I said before, I grew up in a broken home where my mother passed away young and my father struggled with mental illness and addiction that eventually took his life. And things like anxiety and depression and hoarding disorder were just normal everyday life for us. So for me, decluttering wasn't just an uphill battle against stuff, but also against all of the past habits and beliefs that had been hammered into me since I was a child. And I know plenty other minimalists who have had to overcome things like shopping addiction, 
or a scarcity mindset that they had from growing up poor themselves or that was passed down to them by their parents or grandparents from the Great Depression era. And the thing about clutter and mental health is it can really become this kind of chicken and egg dilemma that can just continue to spiral and become more and more overwhelming over time. And along with decluttering, one of the best things I ever did to break free from that cycle was go to therapy, which is why I want to give a big shout out to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this portion of today's video. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who are trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy so that BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network, usually within 48 hours. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel most comfortable, whether that's through a phone call, a video chat, or by messaging them. And if your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. So if you're ready to take control of your mental health, let our sponsor BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can support you by going to betterhelp.com slash life, which not only helps support this channel, but also gives you a special discount on your first month of therapy. And thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. The next comment reads, how can you possibly claim that fewer toys is best for kids? That's just nonsense and cruel to kids. This seems to be a really common belief and a reaction from people who are critical of minimalism, but actually there are quite a few studies that show that having fewer toys is actually better developmentally and intellectually and emotionally for children versus having lots of toys. One group of researchers did a study where they compared children who were given four toys to play with versus 16 toys. And what they found was that the quality of play with children that had fewer toys was better and that they played longer and were more creative with their toys compared with the children who were given more toys. And I think that this really goes to show you that there's this narrative that society and consumerism is pushing on us as parents that says that more toys are better for kids when in reality, most children benefit by simplifying and having less rather than more. Along the same lines, the next person commented, I don't have anything against the decluttering movement that is trending right now. In fact, I've been practicing it for years, but I do take issue with telling people the possible reason they are sick is from clutter. You really don't know that. What true medical studies have shown these statistics? The fact of the matter is illness causes come from many sources and most of them are from high viral lo loads and mold. If there are credible scientific studies that back this up, I would love to read them, but we need to be careful that we don't pass off our opinions as facts. Actually, there has been research into the side effects of clutter and how it can make people sick. Here are just a few of the studies about the negative side effects of clutter. In 2016, one study at Cornell University found that women eat twice as much in messy versus clean kitchens, while other research has found that up to 75% of hoarders are overweight or obese. And a 2009 study from UCLA found that people living in cluttered homes had increased levels of cortisol, and cortisol, also known as the stress hormone, can cause all sorts of negative physical and mental health side effects, everything from anxiety and depression to heart disease and insomnia. And going back to clutter and kids, researchers at Carnegie Mellon found that kids in tidy classrooms performed 13% better academically than children in classrooms that were cluttered. Like I said, a simple Google search would turn up plenty of research about how clutter is bad for you, but one thing I can guarantee that you won't find is research that says clutter is good for you. Next up, Where's her toaster or coffee maker or knife rack or blender? Poor darling has no appliances, no possessions. As a side note, I would just like to say that I cannot stand it when people say things like, oh honey, or poor darling. It's kind of giving Mother Gothel, Ursula, Disney villain vibes, you know what I mean? Poor unfortunate souls, pathetic. Let's debunk this comment right away, shall we? So I guess, this person is assuming that because they can't see the things that they mention on my counters, that that means that I don't own them. But I actually own every single one of the things that she listed in that comment. For example, in this cabinet right here, we have our Ninja Blender and we have the base and then all of the different pieces that make it up 
along with some extra water bottles and our posters that go on the table when we drink tea or coffee. So those are some of the things that we have in this cabinet. And as you can see, because we own so little, I'm able to spread it out because there's just so much space for me to nicely fit, fit my things inside. But if I was crunched for space in here, what I would do is I would get like some kind of basket or bin maybe to contain the smaller pieces of the accessories for the blender to kind of put inside. But because I have so much space, I don't need to do that. Also, decluttering and minimizing my kitchen appliances means that everything then can then fit inside the cabinets, which means that the countertops can remain clear of visual clutter. So it's very relaxing for me to come into my kitchen to bake or to cook because I know that I can always find what I need and I always have space to make what I need to make without a lot of visual clutter, cluttering up the flat surfaces. So stepping over to this cabinet, I want to point out that we do have some other appliances in here. Like we have a toaster, we have a coffee maker, we have our coffee there, we have the grinder that we use to grind our coffee. And then this is my big family sized waffle maker that makes four waffles at once. And I absolutely adore it. I feel like every minimalist YouTuber and their brother has this exact coffee maker, but my husband is the one that drinks the coffee and he hasn't been very impressed with this. So only time will tell if this is something that we're going to keep or declutter in the future. And then stepping over here and ignoring the huge cracks in the floor because this is a furnished rental and it's made really, really badly. We're going to then look into the knife drawer and here is where we have the knives and the knife rack and then also things like our plastic wrap and foil and sandwich bags that we use. So like I said, we have everything that that commenter mentioned, only we're able to tuck it away and keep it out of sight, out of mind, because we've taken the time to radically simplify our kitchen and our entire home. The next person says, I can have my house the way I want it because it is mine and mine alone. Nobody visits me, so life is hard enough not to enjoy the things you like. When I die, 65, the children can donate everything. In the meantime, I'm living my life without complications. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack in that comment. This comment actually reminded me a lot of that old cartoon where there's an older parent standing in front of the garage with their child and they say, one day, son, all of this will be yours. When I try to read in between the lines of this comment, I can see that this might be coming from a place of some loneliness because this person commented that nobody visits them. However, I will say that if your plan is to just leave everything to your children and let them take care of it once you're dead and gone, that's going to be a huge burden on them. Speaking from experience as someone who was left behind by their parents at a very young age and had to deal with that mess and then who has also help other people declutter their homes after the passing of their parents and grandparents. I don't, I don't think that people realize how much of a burden you are putting on your children and your grandchildren when you do this. Not only are they going to be dealing with all of the emotions and the grief and sadness after your passing, it takes so much time, energy, and emotional, physical, and mental bandwidth to be able to deal with all of this stuff. And it can cause a lot of resentment in your descendants if you leave it up to them and don't take care of anything before you pass. But on the other hand, if you start to deal with this stuff while you're still around, that can be a gift not only to them, but also to you. Especially as people age, caring for and maintaining homes that have a lot of stuff in them can be very draining and getting rid of the excess can free up a lot more time and energy to do things that are actually enjoyable versus just sitting in a home with stuff that's collecting a lot of dust. So one resource that I would like to refer this person to or anyone else who is kind of dealing with this kind of thing 
or wanting to shift their mindset or maybe a family member's mindset around this is a book called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. This is probably a really good place to start. This person commented, minimalism only works for people in privileged countries with stable economy. I wish my husband was here to respond to this question because he grew up in China and he was so poor that they didn't even have running water, they didn't have flushable toilets, they didn't have electricity or gas to make a fire or any of that. And he experienced the kind of poverty that most people will never even come close to experiencing. And he would tell you that he's been a minimalist his entire life, and that's probably one of the reasons that he and his family were eventually able to escape poverty and build a wonderful life. I actually think there's a really good quote from the minimalist about this that reads, if anything, people with fewer resources, especially those with less money, can benefit most from minimalism because a minimalist lifestyle helps people determine what truly adds value to their lives, what things actually serve a purpose and bring joy, which is even more important when our resources are limited. Minimalism only works when you can constantly and consistently afford to throw everything away after a single use. I would love to know where this person is coming from with this comment because it just seems so misguided. I don't know a single minimalist who buys something, uses it once, and then throws it away. I know I have clothes in my wardrobe that are 10, 15 or even 20 years old. So to say that we just use something once and throw it away as minimalist is really BS. Most of the minimalists that I know are super intentional and mindful about their purchases and they only bring things into their home when they've identified that it's a true need or because they've really put a lot of thought into it and determined that it would add some kind of value to their lives. But that being said, there's always going to be mistakes that are made. We can't 100% predict the future and know, especially when we try something new that we haven't tried before, if that thing is really going to fit well into our homes and our lives. But even if it doesn't fit, most minimalists aren't just throwing stuff away. They're either donating it or they're giving it away or they're selling it. But we also need to recognize when something didn't work out for us as we expected and it doesn't you know, fulfill our needs or it doesn't add value in the way that we expected and be okay with letting those things go. This person says, an empty house is a sad house. First of all, I don't consider our house empty, not by a long shot. We have a table to sit at, plenty of plates to eat wonderful meals off of, a couch, a TV, beds to sleep in, and even artwork that's meaningful to us decorating the walls. We have all of that and more. And second, this commenter seems to think that material possessions are the key to happiness when over and over studies have found that true happiness boils down to three things. That's meaningful relationships with others, maintaining a pleasant hobby or work environment, and giving back to the community or those in need. And getting rid of our excess clutter is what has given us more time, space, energy, and even money to put towards these kind of things. And as minimalists, we've really reprioritized how we think about stuff. And instead of filling up our home with stuff, we've chosen to fill it up with things like laughter, happiness, and time spent together as a family. This person says, all fun and games until you have to do laundry four times a week because you ran out of stuff to wear. And I would say that if you are doing laundry four times a week because you're running out of things to wear, that probably either means Number one, you've gotten rid of too much stuff and you've gone too far. Or number two, you're doing laundry way too much. And I have made this comment before in one of my videos about laundry and how I do laundry as a minimalist. I think that most people are washing their clothes way too often, like after every single wear. When in reality, you can use the same towel for a week or so. You can wear the same jeans for weeks at a time. And the only time we do laundry is when things are either visibly stained or dirty, or they have gotten a smell to them. Like socks are something that we will wash after every single wear. But 
a pair of pants or a t-shirt doesn't necessarily need to be washed every single time that you wear it. And I would say that I actually do less laundry now that I'm a minimalist because there's less to maintain, first of all, and then I've also gotten more mindful about the things that I just mentioned. After you got rid of 90% of your stuff and there were open spaces in your home, you had the uncontrollable female urge to bin shop Amazon, Ross, Marshalls, Target, and Etsy. Triple laughing face. Wow. I think it's interesting that this person says the uncontrollable female urge to go out and buy things like overspending and buying stuff that you don't need is a female only problem. Seriously, anyone who thinks that overspending and buying frivolous things is a female only problem needs to go watch Ramit Sethi's YouTube channel because there are so many videos of men who are out spending money that they don't have on things like video games and motorcycles and expensive cars like this one guy I just saw in his last episode that had seven trucks yet refused to get rid of any of them despite massive debt. But like I said before, decluttering and minimalism have actually made me a whole lot more mindful about my home and the things that I bring into it. And by extension, also my money and how I spend it. So I only buy things after careful consideration and I even will quite often put things on a shopping list and give myself a cool down period to think about them, whether that's seven days or even up to 30 days or more. So Tell me you do nothing without telling me you do nothing. Like I said before, because we have radically simplified our entire home and we've gotten rid of so much clutter that has given us so much more free time and space, to do things that we actually enjoy. And we spend a lot of time out in nature. We do a lot of hiking. My kids have gotten into swimming and they just made the swim team, which is super exciting for me because I was a big into swimming back in high school. And we do a lot of reading. We go to the library every other weekend and bring home a huge stack of books. And I know that this is kind of a stereotype about minimalists is they just sit around in their empty rooms and do nothing and are at peace with the world. But that's not how everyone lives that's a minimalist, okay? And finally, this person said, real minimalists are not on social media. This person is probably coming from their own mindset about minimalism and what is or is not permissible. But because minimalism is so different for each of us that practice it, that means it's up for each of us to decide how we interpret and practice minimalism. And I'm sure that there are some minimalists who choose not to be on social media and you'll never know about them because they'll never say anything at all. And there's others like me and plenty of my friends who choose to use our platform to spread the joys of decluttering and minimalism. And I would say that this comment is just as misguided as people who say that minimalists shouldn't have kids, minimalists shouldn't live in a house, and instead they should be out on the streets living in a cardboard box. Minimalists shouldn't own more than a hundred items or whatever the arbitrary number that they've decided in their head means that someone is a minimalist. I personally think that minimalism is a tool and just like any other tool, it can be used in good or bad ways. In the hands of a serial killer, a knife is a weapon, but in the hands of a master chef, a knife is something that can be used to nourish and create things of beauty. So just like with that example, minimalism is a tool and it's up for each of us to decide how to use it. And if you would like more help with that, make sure to give this video a like and consider going down and subscribing to my channel and turning on all notifications so that you don't miss any of the weekly videos that I'm sharing here on my channel to help you declutter and simplify your life from A to Z. And if you want to know more about minimalism or check out some ideas on how to get started, make sure to go check out one of these videos or I'll see you next week. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.